All right, everybody. I want to say hello. Welcome to the Gospel Truth tonight. I am John Watson. I am your host, I guess you might say. Get get uh, everything squared away here. Um, I had to spend quite a bit of time this past week trying to get all of this stuff uh, fixed. And um, so I might have to tweak a few things here as we get started. Uh, I do want to say hey, if uh, hey to... Uh, Brother Roy, hey, guess what? I got this going right off the bat tonight. It took me hours and hours and hours to get everything squared away and and uh, redo about everything. But anyway, uh, good to see you, Roy. Uh, if you're watching here tonight, certainly love to hear from you. Comments are certainly welcome. Questions are welcome. We'll do the best we can to answer those. If I'm not answering those questions, then uh, somebody else probably will. Um, awful glad to see uh, uh, Tim with us here tonight, and I'm cer uh, certainly looking forward to many more joining us. Um, see, my my wife has joined us. That's a very good thing. So uh, hopefully this will go smoothly technologically. I need to check my my uh, uh, what is this called YouTube? That yeah, that's that one's looking pretty good. It says excellent connection. So. So that all looks good. Hey, we've got uh, green on multiple levels. Um, so I think I think we're doing well. So all right. So here's what I want to do tonight. Uh, before we get started, I do want to uh, uh, give a shout out to Brother Bill Evans. Uh, he is under the weather. Hey, Bobby Allison, good to see you. And uh, he is under the weather. Has been diagnosed with the dreaded COVID-19. So uh, he's had that. For about a week now, he said he's was feeling pretty crummy to begin with, and but now he's uh, starting to feel better. But he still feels bad, so uh, hopefully he'll join us here tonight. But if you see him on here, uh, wish him well. Be uh, keeping him in your prayers, if you would. We would sure appreciate that. Um, one thing I want to say, and I'll try to remember this again: there is a debate coming up in March. That'd be March 15 and 16. Uh, and 18 and 19. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday debate. That debate will be with me uh, and John Welch of the High School Road Church of Christ. It will be held here in Indianapolis at the High School Road Church of Christ. So we got a few months still to go here. But uh, so looking very much forward to that. It's obviously going to be on the resurrection. That's all they ever want to debate on is the resurrection. But uh, um, it'll be a good debate. I'm I'm. Uh, very, very much convinced of that. Um, uh, that doesn't look good. Oh well, we'll see what we will see what happens here in in just a minute. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, um, if I had an I uh, you know uh, engineer or whatever, this would be a lot easier. I can just say, hey, you do with this. But I'm I am my own engineer. Uh, just a good thing I'm not my own grandpa. Very few of you watching actually know what that means. <laughs> but either way, hey, Barry O'Dell is the preacher at the uh, Mammoth Springs. Let me see if I get this right. Mammoth Springs Church of Christ. Now, that's in Arkansas. Uh, Barry O'Dell I, he seems to be a good enough guy. And um, I, I believe he's intent on uh, trying to do what is right. And uh, that's commendable. I know lots and lots of preachers that disagree with me that are in the Church of Christ, and I think they've got a good heart and they're honest. Uh, I don't really know Barry. Uh, we've talked a little bit once, and um, maybe a little bit of exchange on Facebook and that kind of thing. But but it's not been uh, very productive from getting him to see and come to the truth. Now, obviously, he's going to say, well, it's not productive on his end either because he's not getting me to see and come to the truth. But here's the thing about it. I've already been there and done that and realized that it was wrong. I, and, and he chides me for this in his videos. I would, I would encourage you, go and watch his videos. Uh, they're on Mammoth Spring Church of Christ on YouTube. If I could figure out how to put a, to copy this. Um, let me see. Let me see if I can do this. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm gonna, I am going to put the link um, in a, in the comments here, so you can, uh, you can go to this specific video we're gonna look at tonight. I'm not gonna look at, at the whole video, but um, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna play this, so you'll be able to, you'll be able to see it here in, in just a minute. Matter of fact, uh, I, I forget to 
switch that scene there. Um, so you'll see this here in, in just a minute. And um, I'm going to address something that uh, Bobby Allison, <laughs> Bobby Allison was throwing him some fast balls and some curved balls, and uh, he was striking out on that, in my opinion. And I know he's going to say it was the other way around. But uh, I want to address this, too. I'm not trying to walk all over you there, brother uh, Bobby. But uh, I just, I just, I just had, I have to say something about this. Um, he's watched several of my videos. One video he makes comment of. Um, this is video number five, I do believe, uh, that we're going to examine here in just a moment. But uh, the, the one vi there's one video he's made several comments about. And um, that is, I had to change all the names of these scenes, and now I'm not sure what I got. I, okay, I think this is going to be right here. So anyway, so there's one com one video he's made several comments uh, about with me preaching, it, and I don't remember when this was. It's probably two or three months ago, maybe. And it was called something like... Um, uh, the Real Church of Christ, or uh, What is the Real Church of Christ, I think is what I titled it. Um, I don't ever really title my sermons. I just try to think of something to put on YouTube when I put it on there. But So so that was the general concept. And I spent the uh, first section of the sermon talking about the traditional things of the Church of Christ. And there's no, really nobody in the Church of Christ that's going to disagree with that, um, especially in what we consider the... the uh, liberal and the conservative churches of Christ. The, you know, the five steps to worship and the five steps of salvation. But then the balance of my time, which was probably spent 60-40, you know, in favor of the balance, 60% uh, of it was probably that, anyway, spent talking about that the brethren in the first century believed that Jesus would return in their lifetime. So, anyway, he, he seemed to have a pretty big problem with the fact that I preached for 50 minutes. Whoa! A, a preacher preaching for 50 minutes. I guess that's that's just not right. Um, so, anyway. So, he, he's made that comment a time or two. And he doesn't like the fact that it takes time to study out a, a concept. And, uh, you know, th this is pretty common. The reason I'm telling you this. This is really common for... For people to do this, they they think you know you should be able to read half of a sentence in one verse, and you know to stay right there and formulate your whole opinion on what uh, what the verse is saying. That's not Bible study, and that's not the right way to study the Bible. And I guarantee you that he does not, and not only him, but but so many other people do not study the Bible that way. You know, they spend time. I know they do. They spend time figuring things out, and they go to this passage and that passage and, and so on. Um, let's see. I will... Uh, so we're just going to get right into this now. So I, I hopefully, I spent a lot of time this week trying to get this, um, this figured out, okay? So if you can't hear this, somebody let me know, or uh, actually my wife, if she's paying attention. Let me know if you can't hear what he's saying or if it's got some kind of weirdness going on. I'll figure it out and we'll, we'll get it squared away. So let's go ahead and do this and see what we get here. So, oh, I, I need to I need to transition this. I need to change this. So here he, uh, I'm not going to play the whole video. I'm just, this is one part that I have a real problem with. So important. If we miss that, we miss a lot. Okay, here we go. Uh, okay, Mark, I think Paul took a Nazarite vow. If so, did he sin in doing so? So I'm going to turn back over here to Acts chapter 21 real quick since I mentioned that. And Okay, so let me say something here real quick. He got really upset about me stopping the video and commenting. That's how it's done. Um, so anyway, this is, this, is, this is how I do it. If, if you don't want to be critiqued, you know, I, I get the very same thing, then, then don't put your videos out there. But so uh, I'm just giving you a little lead up to this. Um, in this particular one, I think he was talking about the prophecies of Daniel, and, and he's, you know, in this uh, playlist that he's got going, up refuting AD 70. And apparently, somebody asked the question. So let's uh, let's see what how he answers this question. Did Paul sin when he did what he did in Acts 21? 
appreciate the question, by the way. Thank you, Miss Jean Bailey. Um, I'm, I'm trying my best to explain it, and hopefully it's, it's, uh, my explanation is understandable. But again, just let the dates speak for themselves. Uh, and there's a lot of good research out there that we can use. So Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse... I'm no, just, just going to let this play. Or so, you have this solution that's given by James and the elders of the church, that these guys had taken a vow and that they should go in, that he should go in, pay for their, you know, whatever they needed, and that he himself would be involved in that process. And their goal is to say to people, to specifically the Jews, that, that Paul does walk according to the customs. And so they say, listen, do what we tell you to do. Verse 23, and he does that. Take them and be purified. Um, uh, be purified with them, pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that they may know mm. the things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. I don't see anything in here, Mark, necessarily about a Nazarite vow. There was quite a bit more to a Nazarite vow uh, than just the shaving of the head. Um, this is some type of observation in regard to sacrifice and the law of Moses. And Paul shouldn't have done it. Um, again, you walk orderly and keep the law, verse, uh, verse 25, but concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should otherwise, that, that they should observe no such thing, except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from fornication. So then that, now, now here's another thing that's kind of interesting about this. Paul has been asked not to go to Jerusalem. Wow. If you go there, you're going to be arrested. All right. That's, that's kind of interesting too in the first part of chapter 21. He does it anyway. Somebody even in fact prophesied to him by the Holy Spirit, Acts 21 and verse 11. If you go there, you're going to be arrested. The Holy <laughs> Spirit warned Paul not to do this. And he did it. And guess what? He was arrested. You start reading in Acts chapter 21 and verse 26. He took the men the next day, having been purified with him, entered the temple to announce the expiration of the day's purification, at which time an offering should be made for each one of them. That would include Paul. Yes, I agree, is Roy. That system died at the cross. And they had no, Paul had no business doing this. Again, when you go back to Acts chapter 21 and verse 11, he was told by the Holy Spirit, don't do this. He did it anyway. Uh, but people who hold this position that sacrifice lasted until AD 70, they have to say that with Acts chapter 21 because if, if anything else is different, it changes their doctrine. I think Paul sinned in doing this. <laughs> Um, I believe this. He, he went at this the is request of James and the elders of the church, but he had already been warned by the Holy Spirit not to do it. I think that's significant, too. And so the, the rest of the book of Acts is Paul on trial because he went to Jerusalem against the warning of the Holy Spirit. All right? I, so I, I see a little bit more <laughs> than a Nazarite vow there. Uh, and I do think that he sinned. And there were consequences to his action that followed him uh, well, really, until he was put to death um, at the hand of, well, we're talking about Second Corinthians or Second Timothy chapter four, at the hand of Rome. Got to be careful with the decisions you make. All right, everybody. Okay, so that's that. I think. Well, hang on. Let me let me check one more time. I know that was a lot, a lot. I'm, okay. It, at this point, he just wraps up his uh, wraps up his video. So um, I'm gonna transition back over here so I can check out what I got going on, on my screen because when I'm in full screen mode like that and splitting the screen I cannot see what's going on so so now that I got this uh, squared back away okay so did you hear this Roy I see your comment there uh, yes this is unbelievable this is truly unbelievable and and I'm here to tell you that uh, this camera is obviously wrong I'm so sorry um, let's try that again uh, this this is um, this is uh, dead. Okay, I need to take a breath because he just said that Paul sinned um, in doing this. Okay, he, here's the 
here's the reason. Yes, Bobby, that, that is just glaringly obvious to me. Um, here's the reason um, that he has to have it the way that he has it. Okay? Because if he admits that Paul did something and it was legal, which we know that it was, and that it was spiritually permissible, which it obviously was, and that it was his right, which it obviously was, to do that, then um, the law was still in force and still in effect and, and able to continue um, in the hearts and the minds and the application of the first century members of the body of Christ in the interim period. So that's the reason he has to go out way out on this limb and say that Paul committed sin. Well, let's see. Uh, Bobby just made a, a great point here, by the way. Um, Bobby, do you you got my phone number, don't you? Um, I would I would love to hear from you. Give me a call. I'll put you on speaker here, and we'll talk about this a little bit. We'll go back and forth. Um, um, if you don't have it, let me know. I'll get it to you. One of us will. Um, so, matter of fact, let me go ahead and turn this on here. Powering so, on. you are now paired. Enjoy. So, uh, anyway, if you're in a position, Bobby, where you can give me a call, go ahead and do that. Uh, so, Bobby makes this great point, and and this is the first thing that came to my mind when I heard him say this. Where does it say that he committed sin in this? It doesn't. It simply doesn't. And, he, and you know, here's the, here's the point um, that I've made in my video about him um, the last time. I'll just create a playlist so that people can go back and listen to all these videos. But, um, so here's my point. One of the points that I tried to make is he, he says, and so many other people say, that, um, uh, you know, we're hypocrites and, you know, all this other stuff, and we, we do nothing but eisegesis. Who's the hypocrite? He simply inserted that in, into the passage in, in Acts 21. That's the plain and simple. He inserted it there. So um, that's that's as good as as, as it's going to get. You know something? Uh, what's, what's good for the goose is good for the gander here, right? Um, sorry, this, this camera, I don't, I don't know what the deal is here. So let me try this again. Okay, so there's the first thing. But let's go back and let's look at this and let's read this and let's, let's see what the deal is. Um, oh, hey, Holger's calling. Hey there, brother. Uh, hang on. I, I I don't know if I got you or not. Let's do okay. it. Okay, there we go. All right. Okay, got you. I didn't think, I didn't think uh, Bobby was calling in, so I said, well, if you don't mind, I'll call in. Oh, no. No, no problem here. Yeah. Um, so it, it's amazing. Really, it's amazing. What's the preacher's name who said that Paul's in? Um, Barry Odell. Odell, okay. Yeah, very Odell. I uh, want to make sure I've got who this is. All right, now, he mentioned the Holy Spirit telling him not to go to Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Well, the Holy Spirit revealed he would be arrested. The disciples didn't want him to go. Paul knew he had to go. Right. And so even though the Holy Spirit said he would go and be arrested, he still went. It wasn't that the Holy Spirit told him not to go. No, 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 no. That's right. That would have been a direct violation of the Spirit's leading. And Paul says in Acts 23, verse 1, I have done all things in good conscience before God, mm -hmm. including everything that took place in Acts 21. So in Acts 23, verse 1, it's absolute the answer. Now we also yep. know that Paul wrote the book of Romans before he goes to Jerusalem, because of Romans 15, 31, he prays that his service would be received. So Paul writes the entirety of the book of Romans, knows his relationship to the law, goes to Jerusalem, and at the behest of James the elders of the Jerusalem church, he does what he does. So if this preacher says that Paul sinned, not only did Paul sin, but James, an apostle, sinned. But not only did James, an apostle, sin for participating with him, the entire eldership of the Jerusalem church that's exactly right. But not only that, there were thousands of Jewish believers who were also zealous of the law. 
So now he's got the entirety of the church in Judea in sin, and everybody's lost, according to him. Yeah, uh, the, the implications of, of his statement that Paul sinned is, is he obviously didn't think that one through. <laughs> no, no, no. But he, you know, he's got a lot of books in his library, but he, ought to, he, he hasn't been paying attention to the book much, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, and uh, I've seen some of these guys that, you know, they parade their books around like they've got some great knowledge. The guy didn't have a clue. In all due respect, sorry, you know, to be over the top with him maybe a little bit, but he didn't have a clue. And Acts 23, verse 1 refutes uh, what this fellow said about Paul. Paul did in all things in good conscience, including what he did in Acts chapter 21. Uh, uh, and, a, he, and if amen. he wrote the book of Romans before, he knew his relationship to the law. So mm -hmm. it, it, his doctrine is refuted. It, John, is this preacher um, in Indianapolis by chance? He's in Arkansas. Arkansas, okay. I, I think it's Arkansas. Let, let me double check here and I'll tell you. Um, Mammoth, Mammoth Spring Church of Christ Mammoth in Arkansas. Yeah. yeah, I'd like to... Uh, uh, now, did he say this? in answer to you, or did he say well, he, he was just doing a show? Um, actually, uh, he and I studied. Okay. Um, okay. And, um, you know, I asked him several questions, and uh, some he had good answers for. I mean, the standard answers, but you yeah, know, yeah. He, he had them down good. And uh, others he, he didn't have an answer for, and this was one of them. So he's, uh, he said that he studied and studied and studied, and this is his conclusion, essentially. Um, but he has okay. a, a playlist on YouTube, six videos. Okay. Um, okay. Well, I'm not all of them. Oh. Not all of them based on me, but some of them. Uh, but uh, also, <laughs> also, uh, uh, you come in there, and Steve comes in there. So uh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyways, um, I appreciate uh, you reviewing this very thing. But I'll tell you what. The future is ought to run from Acts 21 because we'll 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 stomp them in yeah. Acts chapter 21. That's exactly right. Acts 21 right. is apostolic example. It's it's an it is an approved apostolic example that tells us the law was still operating 25 years after Pentecost. A full 25 years after Pentecost, mm -hmm. the law is still operating, and James and the elders of the Jerusalem Church want to make sure that all the Jewish believers know that Paul keeps the law and Paul was keeping the law. Yeah. I'll tell you what, that's the worst exegesis I think I've ever uh, been aware of any preacher in the church, the, the, the fellow who just did that. That's just, it, it's just awful. It, but, it is. Listen, I'm going to let you go. I'm going to go, I'm going to go ahead and listen again. So, hey, uh, hey, by the I'm way, gonna, um, yeah. help me with a little something technical here. Could you hear him okay? A little bit, yeah. He, 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 I, he wasn't quite as clear as I wanted him to be, but it's okay. Uh, yeah, his his audio is really low on that recording anyway. Yeah, so, yeah, so yeah. Uh, but I, I I was I was getting most of what he said. Okay, great. All right, All sounds right. good. Thank you, brother. Okay. Appreciate God it. Bless my friend. You right, too. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, well there you have it. The the show's over. Holger said it all. <laughs> so, but I still have a few few more things to say. Um, okay, so. Let's let's just go over some of these things. I mean, I mean, Holger sold uh, eighty percent of my thunder, but I got twenty percent left, <laughs> so that's enough to to fill another half an hour, thirty five minutes or so. Here's the deal. So here, uh, Holger pointed out, and I think rightly, that in Acts twenty one, Paul was fulfilling this Nazarite vow. I'm going to show you why I think that he did that in just a moment. Uh, and I think that his vow started before he ever got there. And even if it didn't, it still um, it still could have been a Nazarite vow, um, even in, at such short notice. And I'll, I'll tell you that in just a moment. But here are some of the plain things that you got to pick out here. Now, he said Paul sinned. Well, where does it say that Paul sinned? You know, they, they harp on us long and hard. The word, keep it in context. Don't don't run here and there and all this. Okay, well, keep it in context, Barry, or anyone else who wants to use it uh, to uh, to do this uh, or use this in such a way. Keep it in context. Well, in the context, 
like you say, then where does it say that Paul sinned? It doesn't. It does not say that. It says he went to Jerusalem. The context of this, as Holger pointed out, was he went against the advice or the wishes of the brethren. Um, I mean, they followed him crying with tears, and they said, no, don't go. And he said, I have to go. Uh, we don't have time to read all of it, but that's essentially kind of the, the deal. So he gets to Jerusalem. James and the elders, if Paul sinned, they encouraged him to. So now you have James committing sin by telling Paul to do this. And you have uh, uh, the elders telling him, commanding him, ordering him to sin. Because uh, now they're involved. You have thousands of thousands of brethren who had heard that Paul, listen to this. What did they say? He says, uh, verse 20, when they heard it, they began glorifying God. This is Acts 21. Began glorifying God and said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed and they are all zealous for the law. What? Well, wait a minute. Was James not telling them? If, if, if following the law, these brethren were following the law, why wasn't James telling them they were still zealous for the law? Why weren't the elders rebuking them? Listen to this, verse 21. They had been told about you that you are teaching the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Isn't that what, by, by Barry's definition, that Paul should have been doing? That he should have been telling them that they were wrong, they shouldn't be following Moses because it was nailed to the cross at Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14. By the way, what was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2? It was the fact that the law couldn't save and that salvation had come and Jesus was the first fruits and that's a whole other study, but that's what was nailed to the cross. Look at the context. Anyway, verse 21, They had been told about you that you are teaching the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to... Sorry about the the pop-up sounds here. I don't know how to... I don't know how to do that where they don't do that. Anyway, uh, telling them not to circumcise uh, their ch uh, children, nor to walk according to the customs. So here's the question. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore, do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Listen to this closely. We have four men who are under a vow. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and all will know that there is nothing to the things which they have been told about you. Here's what James and the elders said. We want you to take these four Christian brethren who are under this vow. They're going to the temple. You go with them. You pay their their way and you shave your head with them. You go in there and you do these things with them. Now notice this. I'm going to skip ahead for just a second. In verse um, 26 it talks about the, the days of purification. Uh, then Paul took the men and the next day purifying himself along with them, went into the temple giving notice of the completion of the days of purification until the sacrifice was offered for each one of them. Here's the way this works. So when you're under the Nazarite vow, and here's the reason you shave your hair. You're under this vow, okay? Uh, most people don't even know what the Nazarite vow is. But... Um, <laughs> um, Sorry, I'm kind of looking at these comments over there. So you make the vow. The vow is something that you cannot break. You cannot break it. So whenever you hear this, this terminology, you know, perform your vows unto the Lord, you have to perform these vows. They don't let you out of this. So you have to do this. Queen Helena, about 30 AD, said, I'm going to uh, uh, take this vow. By the way, men and women could take the vow. And she took the vow and made it almost seven years. She had vowed. To, so, so the person taking the vow uh, sets the time limit. It's a minimum of 30 days. Uh, and it could be a maximum of the rest of your life or your entire lifetime. Uh, it could be imposed on you by your parents or it could be self-imposed. There's lots of rules and regulations. We don't have time to explain all of them. 
So anyway, she said, I'm going to take this vow. And uh, it was to not be around dead bodies. You would have to cut your hair at some point, and you could have nothing whatsoever to do with anything from the grape, whether it was wine or vinegar uh, from the grape, or even the skin or the seeds, nothing whatsoever. So no peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Um, grape jelly, anyway. Um, so it was, it, and this was as a dedication to the Lord. It didn't mean that you had committed sin, by the way. So when you take the Nazarite vow, it could be because you're doing it out of thanksgiving to Yahweh. It could also be that you're doing it to um, um, repent, you know, in, in you know, kind of a way, you know, you're paying some penance, uh, uh, for lack of a better term. So when you, that's the way this worked, and it took her 21 years to fulfill her seven-year vow. Because she would get to the end of it and something would happen uh, or somewhere uh, in the middle of it. and took her 21 years to fulfill her seven-year vow. So this is how serious this was. So when you make a vow, you have to see it through to the end. Now here's the thing about this, as Bobby Aptly points out. Genesis 6, 1 through 21, teaches the, the particulars about this, uh, essentially. And when you were going to end the vow... You went into the temple and you had to make these sacrifices, several different sacrifices. And the sacrifices would be burnt on an altar. And you would shave your head and burn your hair in the fire that has that, that you're using to, uh, for the, to burn the sacrifice. Okay, so then, then it's over and these are the days of purification. Now notice in verse 27... Uh, in Acts 22, it says, When the seven days, so they had to purify themselves for a week, seven days were almost over. The Jews from Asia uh, came and uh, seeing him in the temple, began to stir up all the crowd and laid hands on, my, on him and so forth and see how this goes uh, throughout the next uh, couple chapters. So all of this started a, a big, huge problem for him. Now, that's how this works. He had to go to the temple. But if he was not under the Nazarite vow, okay, they were going in for the days of purification. This would have only been one week. And the minimum time for this is 30 days. According to Ellicott and Barnes and many others, you can look these up wherever, wherever you got them on this passage. Um, they point out that it is um, very, let's see, um, well, let me just say this, uh, Dennis. I appreciate you you disagreeing, but you're disagreeing with what's said here and what is stated in the scriptures. There's no way around this. So, if uh, uh, if the minimum time was 30 days, then how could Paul go with him and to the temple and uh, complete this Nazarite vow? Well, you could join yourself to some people who had already c uh, completed their vow, uh, and they were going to the temple for those seven days. But to do that, this was the, the loophole, right? Uh, it was a way to skirt the issue. To do that, you had to pay their way. You had to pay for their sacrifices and everything. That's what Paul was doing. Paul was following number six in accordance to the law of Moses. You can not deny this other than to commit a serious act of uh, eisegesis. And so many are willing to do that to simply get out of it. Now, so those are some of the most obvious things here. But I think that it's very important for us to go back here. I want you to go back to uh, Acts chapter 18. So we, so we go to Acts chapter 18. Now, um, actually, I think I need to uh, pull something up here real quick. Acts. Oh, right there, what do you know? Okay, so, um, but then I'm going to need this one. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just have both these ready to roll here. So we're going to look at a couple terms here. Um, uh, this is Acts 18, verse 18. So Paul, having reminded, uh, re I'm sorry, remained many days longer, took leave, of the brethren and put out to sea for Syria. Um, lost my place. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila. And in Centria, 
he had his hair cut for he was keeping a vow. Now, knowing what we know from, from uh, Numbers chapter 6, right? So knowing what we know from that, I, do, I, do I need to turn over to Acts chapter 6? Um, no, we, we, may, we may go over there yet, but uh, I, I think I can do this. Um, you, you just need to study Acts, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Numbers chapter 6. Without that knowledge, that background knowledge, uh, you might miss a little bit of this, but I tried to explain that uh, in brief just a moment ago. So, notice what it says. In Centria, he had his hair cut, for he was keeping a vow. Now, remember what we just said. In, in uh, Numbers chapter 6, and I just pointed this out, and in uh, Acts chapter 21, it is uh, evident that they had to shave their head. Okay? They had to shave their head, and they had to burn the... Uh, the hair. Here's uh, here's how. Here's another thing I want to point out about the the Nazarite vow. This is how serious they took it. If uh, someone who was under a Nazarite vow, you could tell that they were a Nazarite uh, under this vow because their hair would often be very long. Um, so if a guy walked by, walked down the street, and and you know he's under a Nazarite vow, and you say, uh, "I do that too," then you're you just committed to be under a Nazarite vow. So. That's the people knew. If you had this long hair, it hadn't been cut. I mean, think about John the Baptist. John the Baptist was <laughs> the epitome of the Nazarite vow. He had, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, he was given by his parents to uh, fulfill that for his lifetime, which obviously he did. But um, according to Luke one, but I mean, he had long hair. Samson was a lifer as well, given by. You know, his mother made the deal with, with uh, Yahweh, and she said, hey, if you give me a child, I'll, I'll commit him to you, the Nazarite vow. And he had long hair, and Delilah, you know, took advantage of that. Uh, Samuel would have been the same way. He was a lifer as well, given by his parents. As a matter of fact, I think Samuel and Samson were both only child, only children. But, um, and I can tell the difference, one turned out good. He was a prophet. That was his reward, I guess. And the other one had strength and really wasn't so good, but I guess it worked out in the end, right? But uh, but either way, um, so that's how you could tell. So this hair thing is very important. That's why I went back and made mention of that. It's extremely important. So um, here's, uh, do I have this up here? Right there. So he said he had his hair cut because he was keeping a vow, right? So here's the way this reads. On on the now following day, went in Paul with us unto James. No, wait, that's the wrong one. I need Acts 18, uh, verse 18. That was 21. Uh, I'm reading out of the inter interlinear. Now Paul, uh, now Paul more having re remained days many, the brothers having taken leave, sailed away to Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shaved uh, in Centria the head he had for a vow. Now, when we look at this word for shaved, Oh, I meant to transition this. Sorry. So when we look at this word for shaved, let me find my place here again. Um, so let me open this up, and 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 you can see this here. Um, it's this word, uh, Cairo. Okay, and it means um, you can see its usage here uh, to shear is the definition, but it is I. I cut my own hair or have my hair cut. All right. Now this might be um, insignificant to you, but um, actually, what am I doing here? Uh, let me come back here. So, so we got this word here that means I cut my own hair or I have my hair cut. So he did that in Centria. Well, why is that significant? Because if he was keeping a vow. It's very clear from the law that you cannot end this vow unless you do it at the temple to make the sacrifice. However, here's what we know from uh, tradition. And at the time that Paul was alive, uh, you could cut your hair once a year. If you are under a Nazarite vow, and say you've taken a multi-year, seven years, right? You, you say, I'm going to do this for seven years. Uh, you could cut your hair. Um, once in that time period, because it, if it was 
too hot, it was too irritating, it, it was too cumbersome, you could cut your hair. But you could only do that once a year. That would explain this, possibly. I don't think it's the only explanation. But it would explain it, possibly. He was under a vow. By their tradition, they could do this once a year. They could cut their hair once a year. So that would explain it. He, did, he was under a vow while he was at Santria, and he cut his hair. It wasn't to end the vow. Right? Not to end the vow. But the interesting thing about this, let me go back over here to this. Um, in verse, let's, let's just keep reading. In verse, um, I really ought to pull this up on the screen. Let me do that. Um, I wish I wish they had the LSV on here. That would be really nice. Uh, let's do, we'll just do the King James Version. Uh, Max 18 KJV. So because I want to show you this, because the New American Standard um, does not use this terminology, sadly. Um, okay, so I've got this pulled up here, so let me go ahead and, and, and show you this since I got it on the screen. So in Acts 18, this is where it's, uh, I am at Acts 18, right? Yeah. Um, it said, so at, uh, having shorn his head in Centria, for he had a vow. That's the way it is stated in uh, the King James Version. And verse 19, uh, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So when they had desired him to tarry longer, uh, with them he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. So he just said, as he stayed there in Ephesus for a while, they, you know, they wanted him to stay, and he said, I can't do it. I have to go to Jerusalem. Okay, here's a couple things that are really important to consider, right? He said, by all means, I have to go to Jerusalem. I have to go to Jerusalem. Why did he have to go to Jerusalem? He was under a vow. It was coming time for him to end his vow. So he joined those brethren at Jerusalem to end his vow. That's, that makes sense to me. And you might say, well, it was too long a period of time. We don't know exactly how long it was. I'm sure we can figure it out. But it doesn't matter. He could have said, well, I'm going to have this vow for 10 years. And if it took him 10 years, then um, that's that was what the vow was. He had to, he had to perform that vow. All right? So um, there is an explanation. Okay? He could have, he could have uh, also taken a vow... While he was in Centria. I want you to think about this. So we're still in Acts 18. This is just a couple explanations of why he cut his hair before he was in Jerusalem. He could have taken a vow while he was in Centria uh, after he cut his hair in anticipation that his hair would grow long by the time he got to Jerusalem. Okay, he cut his hair. Now that is different than what we see in Acts chapter... 21. I need I need the center runner. Okay, so I'll, let me let me pull this up here and do three things at one time. So, um, in Acts 21, it says, and the term that is used is that. Um, let me find this here. Um, according to the customs, it says the head um, in verse 24. So this is what I need. Let me transition this here. I hope I don't make anybody sick by scrolling through all this. Okay, so in Acts 24, here's what the inner linear says. Let me make this larger. That, that'll, that'll help. It says, uh, These men having taken, um, be purified with them and bear expense for them so that they will shave the head and will know all, the, all that of which they have been informed about you uh, nothing is but you walk orderly yourself keeping the law okay but so here notice this term okay for they will shave so we're just gonna look this up here uh, and it's it's a different word and it means I shave shear cut off the hair um, zurao I guess is how you would pronounce it 
So uh, I know I'm going through this, this rather quickly, but do you see the difference here between the two? You've got in Acts 18, he cut his hair. Either before he took the vow or in the midst of the vow, which was permissible. But it's in Acts 21, after he makes his trip to Jerusalem, where he said, I have to go by all means. In other words, um, come rain or sleet or hail or snow or dark of night. He's going to get there. He has to get there. And, and I'm, just, I'm just saying, you know, this is how I see it. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about it. But he said, I have to get to Jerusalem. Now, the couple things you got to take into consideration. Why did he get to have to get to Jerusalem so direly? Because he was going there, listen to this, but taking leave of them, saying, I will, uh, by all means, this is how the New American Standard reads it, which they drop the ball here. Uh, by taking leave of them and saying, I will return to you again if God wills, he set sail from Ephesus. But what should be in there, and the LSV reads it this way, by all means to keep the coming celebration at Jerusalem. He said, I have to get there. He was going there to keep the feasts, guys. Hey, people, listen to this. He was going to Jerusalem by all means to keep the feasts. Is that Jewish law? Mosaic law? You better believe it is. He had to go to the temple. And there he, he either uh, ended his um, uh, vow that he was under, his Nazarite vow, or he joined himself uh, to the others um, and partook in the vow again, either way, how, however you want to look at this, right? He went there. He partook in the law. Everybody knew it. They encouraged him to do it so that they would know that he wasn't telling them not to follow the law of Moses. There is no way around this, period. Now, let's recap just a little here. Because you have this clear illustration. Listen to what they said. Let me go back over this. Because uh, I don't think Dennis Lang can hear these words. <laughs> so I'm going to read them louder. Uh, but so many of our brethren simply cannot understand these words. Let me read this again. Now, now, based on everything we just looked at, we talked about the points that have been made. I'm going to read this. and You just plug this in. This is Acts 21, verse 17. After we arrived in Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The brethren at Jerusalem didn't think he was doing anything wrong. And they received him gladly. And the following day, Paul went in with us to James and the elders. Uh, and or To James and all the elders were present. After he had greeted them... Wait, what, by the way... Um, did James have any standing here and any authority? Hmm, I think so. What about the elders there in Jerusalem? They had some authority, no question about it. That's what elders have. That's what's given to them. They were all present. After he had greeted them, he began to relate one by one the things which God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. So here Paul saying, listen, the Gentiles are being reached. What message was he preaching to the Gentiles? He was preaching the message from Acts 15. This is the same message that James said, hey, maybe, maybe we should uh, do this. Uh, so go back there and study that Jerusalem council. Um, so he says, hey, we're reaching the Gentiles. Uh, this is the ministry. It's going great. And when they had heard it, they began glorifying God. Did they have any problem with what Paul was teaching and preaching? No, they were glorifying Yahweh. And they said to him, you see, brother... How many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed? Wait a minute. Who are these people that they're now talking about in the thousands? Jewish Christians. In, in the first century, especially uh, near to the crucifixion of Christ and, and following, um, there were not Jews and Christians. There were Jewish Christians. Right? Right? There was a transition period. It took some time for this. I mean, um, 
when Russia and China come over here and they annex the United States, it's going to take some time to, to get us on board with all of their laws and all of their stuff. And it will take a generation, I guarantee you. They'll have to raise a generation of people to accept it and all the indoctrination that has to happen and all that. So just be prepared. I'm just saying. But anyway, that's how this works. It works in every country that it's ever happened to. Now, think about this. So they did not have any problem with what he was saying and what he was teaching. But they said, here is a little bit of a hiccup and that we need you to clarify this. To these thousands of Jewish Christians, by the time 70 came around, um, there was no distinction any, or no, uh, there was a distinction from that point. There were Jews only, and then there were Christians. And the Jews who remained were not Jews. We understand that study. Uh, they thought they were Jews. The temple had been destroyed. Everything had been destroyed. Everything that made them a Jew was gone. The law had come to an end. It was emphatic and definitive. And then there was this separation and hatred between the two. Anyway, so here we go. Uh, let me read verse 20 over again. When they had heard it, they began glorifying God, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. And they have been told about you. What did James and the elders teach these thousands of brethren, Jewish Christians, about the law? What do you read into this? And they have been told about you. What did they teach about the council, right? And they have been told about you that you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. They're saying, these guys have heard that you're teaching the Gentiles to not circumcise their children or to walk according to the customs. Let me read that again. They have been told about you that you are teaching all the... Uh, I said uh, Gentiles. I meant Jews. That you are teaching all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. Telling them not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the Scriptures. This would have been the perfect opportunity to clear, for, for Paul to have spoken up and to have said, I'm teaching Colossians 2.14 the way the brethren in the 21st century in, in the churches of Christ teach it. He, he could have spoken up and said that, but he didn't. Verse 22, here's the question from James and the elders. What then is to be done? They will certainly hear that you have come. Therefore, here's what James tells them to do and the elders. Do this that we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Now we know what the vow was. We know that these men are Christians. Jewish Christians. Take them and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses. Now we know why he had to pay their expenses because he was joining them in the midst of their vow so that they may shave their heads and all will know that... Listen to this. He says, Do these things so that everybody will know that there is nothing to the things which have been told about you that you yourself also walk orderly, keeping the law. There is no way possible for anybody to deny that Paul was keeping the law. We saw it in Acts 18. We see it here. We see it multiple times. Why was he keeping the law? Well, you can answer that any way that you want. And whatever the, the answer as to why he was keeping the law comes... The fact remains, he was keeping the law. He said, nothing is going to keep me from getting to Jerusalem for those feast days, for that celebration. Nothing. A Jew had to go to Jerusalem for three times. He had to travel to Jerusalem three times in the year for, to be there and do those things. And why was Paul going there? Because he was heading to Jerusalem, as we read, by all means to keep the celebration. What's the celebration? It's the feast days. Um, probably, actually, well, I don't, I don't know which one, if he was in the spring feast or the uh, fall feast. Probably the fall is, is kind of my guess, but uh, it's just a guess. Um, which, by the way, those last three feasts are indicative of the coming of the Lord. You realize that, right? That's why the Jews kept them. So once 
The temple fell, that means the Lord has come. No more feasts, no more Jews, no more temple. The Lord has come. Uh, that's just a little information. Okay, so let me keep reading. But concerning the Gentiles who have believed, we wrote, having decided that they should abstain from meat, sacrificed idols, this Acts 15, right? Starting what? Uh, verse 13 or so. Uh, that they should abstain from uh, meat, sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from what is strangled, and from fornication. They didn't require the Jews to keep the law. I'm, I'm sorry, the Gentiles. Why do I keep doing that? <laughs> they did not require that, did they? Um, no. Go back to the to the council. Verse 26, Then Paul took them in, and the next day, purifying himself along with them, went into the temple. If Paul, under the Spirit and, and guidance uh, of the Spirit, why would he have not said, No, I can't do this. This isn't right. This is not right. The law has has disappeared, and we can't keep perpetuating this. And and I had a, I actually had a preacher tell me that it would be okay to do this today. It'd, it'd be okay to do this today to get someone to come to Christ. Okay, well then let's just let's just go down to the Baptist church and, and start worshiping uh, and doing things that we know that they do that are wrong just to get them to come to the Church of Christ. Let's see how many times has that worked. Let's go to the Catholic Church and, and let's uh, do all of those things and start baptizing and sprinkling babies. Oh, they, how many times has that worked? You know something? He did it because it was what he was supposed to be doing. He did it because it was right to do. He did it because it was his prerogative to do it. What happened? I just made mention of this. What happened at the destruction of Jerusalem? I know some of our futurist friends are getting ready to blow their stack because I'm leaving the context. I'm going to some remote context. In Hebrews chapter 9, listen to this. Verse 1. Now, even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and earthly and the earthly sanctuary. <laughs> this is what we just saw in Acts, in Acts 21. So even the first covenant had regulations of divine worship and the earthly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle prepared, the outer one, uh, in which were the lampstand and the table and the sacred bread. This is called the holy place. Behind the second veil there was a tabernacle which is called the holy of holies, having a golden altar and incense and the ark of the covenant, which was not in there in the second temple period because it was gone. Um having a golden altar of incense, the Ark of the Covenant, covered on all sides with gold, in which was a, a golden jar holding the manna and, and uh, Aaron's rod which budded and the tables uh, of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim in glory overshadowing the mercy seat. But of these things we cannot uh, speak in detail because there was a lot of detail um, about all these things. Anyway, Verse 6, Now when these things have been so prepared, the priests are continually enter the outer tabernacle, performing the divine worship. But into the second, only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the sins of the people committed in ignorance. Why on earth is Paul going through all these things? He says, I can't go into detail now. They knew this. And I know the argument these guys want to say, oh, well, uh, you know, uh, these are all uh, all the Christians, uh, pretty much in the first century. Hi, Isaac. By the way, were um, were all Gentiles. I'm going to tell you what I think, for whatever it's worth. And I don't I don't care if you like this or not. I mean, it's just my thought here. This is my opinion. But I think a great many of the Gentiles, if not all of them, when they became Christians in the first century, were required by the Jewish brethren. Get this. This is why they wanted them to keep the law. They were required to proselytize. That was part of baptism. Baptism was part of proselytization. You realize that? Um, one of these things, by the way, that you had to do uh, in um, keeping the uh, Nazarite vow, when you went into the temple, you know what you had to do? You had to be baptized. You were cleansed. So you went into the mitzvah, and you were baptized. And then you went in. Uh, this was a, a washing. Not a sprinkling, it was a wash. Okay, so 
there we are. And he says, here's the temple. These are the things. That, and why did all this happen? Because in verse 7, Hebrews 9, into the second only the high priest enters once a year, not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and the sins of the people committed in ignorance. This is the reason that the uh, four, five, sixth feast happened, the Feast of Atonement. This blood of this bull was offered for the sins of the people committed in ignorance, um, not the high handed sin. If you were a Jew in the first century or a good proselyte, you would know Numbers 15 and, and this explanation of this. Um, you know, the, the, the blood was shed for those who wanted salvation. It's just that simple. Not the ones who committed these high-handed sins or defiant sins, I think the New American Standard says, and there's other terms that are used there. But anyway, you might check that out. So notice what this says in verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed while the outer tabernacle is still standing. If you look at the words here, it's while the tabernacle has standing. While the temple has standing. or I'm sorry, the law has standing. The evidence that the law still has standing is the fact that the temple is still standing. Once the temple is destroyed, that is the sign, the type and the anti-type, the shadow, however you want to look at this, but it's the sign that the law no longer has standing. I'm going to read that again. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not yet been disclosed. Well, what holy place? They went into it once a year. They went into it once a year. Um, so they knew how to get in there. But how do you get into the holy place? <laughs> the holy place is heaven. How do we know this? Verse 23. Therefore it was necessary for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What copies of the things in the heavens were being cleansed with the blood? Think about that. The things in the heavens being cleansed with the blood were the things in the copy, which was the temple. Josephus says, and, and this is well understood by anyone who cares to check this out, that the temple was a picture of a physical representation of heaven, the spiritual heaven. And he says, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Now, I'm just running way out of time here, but I think the point has been made. And the best way I know how to put this is uh, uh, Brother Odell. If you're watching this, or anyone else who would try to teach this, you simply cannot teach that Paul committed sin from Acts 21. You're inserting it in every way. You are breaking every last possible hermeneutic rule just so you can protect a 2,000-year-old deception begun by the Jews in the first century because they were looking for a Messiah to come and do what they thought he should do that became Christianized somehow, and uh, here it is still perpetuated today by so many. All right, um, that's it. That's all I got for tonight. There's plenty more on that, but uh, that's enough to uh, make, <laughs> make a stir. Um, a pretty good one, I'm sure, too. But you know something, and I, and I, think, I think Holger made a great point here. Uh, in Acts 23 and verse 1, Paul says, Paul, looking intently at the council, he said, Brethren, I have lived my life with a perfectly good conscience before God up to this day. Do you suppose Paul would have known whether or not it was right or wrong in front of thousands of brethren to commit that kind of sin? If it was wrong, if it was wrong or sinful for him to do that in front of thousands and thousands of people, do you think he would have just went, well, yeah, I guess I'll go ahead and do this and I'll repent of it later? I don't think so. I don't think so. That, 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 just, that is not at all 
Paul. Amen, Brother Bobby Allison. Conjecture on their part. Can anybody say eisegesis? <laughs> if you're not sure what that means, look it up. It just means you just, they're just inserting it into the passage. All righty, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's as good as I'm going to get here tonight. I thank you all so much. Hey, be with us next week at the uh, same time, 8 o'clock. And got lots of good things going on. I'm, I'm hoping to have Solomon uh, Baidu. I've uh, been talking to Paul Ralph. Hopefully we'll be able to have him and get him squared away to do this uh, at some point. And uh, have a little bit of a discussion with, with him as well. And I just look forward to all the great great things that are coming out. Keep all of our brethren throughout the world that are uh, in harm's way in your prayers. And uh, anyone who's preaching the truth, I can promise you this, is in harm's way. There are people who oppose it. Uh, in some countries worse than others, but uh, they need our prayers. That's it. Love y'all. I will see you next time. Um, this is this is it. Just guys, uh, let's just study because all of this boils down to one thing. Everything that we teach and that we do proves salvation and the need for it. Jesus said, "He who believes and is baptized will be saved." Do you remember? about repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come in repentance. That's set smack dab in the middle of some of the most uh, powerful prophecy ever. Prophecy proves Jesus as the Messiah that the first century generational Jews were looking, excuse me, looking to come for salvation, to bring salvation. If you're not in Christ, being baptized into him and added to the body, where does that leave you? Outside of heaven. That's it. I'm out. I'll see you all next week. Love each and every one of you. If I can figure out how to shut this off the right way, I never have figured that one out. So.